Thanks, Mark. So, uh, Michael, I don't think I've ever called you Michael. How many know it's Nick? Nick has a similar accent to myself, so if you're struggling with me, I want to close your ears for Mick. Those are Irish tones. Um, Mick is, uh, has been an urban design tutor here for the last couple of years, a um, big part of the urban design program and all our studio teaching here and the yearbook that we'll introduce later, um, but also conducts a series of different researches um, and he'll like to talk today, I think it's temporary urbanism, um, oh, happy, healthy, temporary, there you go, so he did. Yeah, it's a progressively critical take actually on happy, healthy temporary development. I'm going to try and do the cameraman a favour and stand here, essentially. <laughs> All right. So there's a long-standing connection between the presence of vacant and derelict land and a wide range of negative socioeconomic implications and consequences, whether it be income or employment or health, uh, housing, living environment or crime. And temporary use has always been a response to mediating the problem of vacancy and dereliction, and the common rep response has always been good quality surface car park. <laughs> but in the post-recessionary or in the early 2008 period, we started to actually see a divergence from that type of thinking towards more high-profile landmark versions of temporary urbanism. And if you see buried amongst the sea of car park in our reconstituted shipping containers and a yurt restaurant, do you see them? <laughs> This is the kind of stuff that was going on. So essentially in a post to divergence, actually people started to get very sick of temporary urbanism. Mainstream mediatic representation was that it's an obnoxious phenomenon, it needs to go away and pop up and pop off. But actually there were a lot of questions to be answered. And really what the whole focus was, was about extraordinary temporary solutions of innovative, cultural, creative projects orientated toward leisure, trade, tourism and urban greening beach bars in Berlin, pallet pavilions in New Zealand, and urban orchards. And I mean, I've never been to an urban orchard, which is a start, but really interesting innovative developments. However, the entire discourse was largely focusing on the power of temporary use, the potential of temporary use, and even in some cases, the magic of temporary use. And so the whole point of this was kind of knock temporary use down a peg or two and get to grips with the reality of it, because actually there must be something wrong with it. It couldn't be as good as every, every urban orchard. I've never seen one. So that's what this is about. And it was temporary use in England's core cities. And actually, it's a comparison between these extraordinary versus the ordinary. So high profile versus good quality surface car park. And there were three focus areas. One was on the extent, the level of temporary development in cities, spatial patterns, and finally, the perception of temporary development by the development industry, by ourselves, by professionals. What do they mean? Why would we use them? And so in that sense, what's the extent of happy, healthy temporary development? Well, across a national landscape of England's core cities over a 15-year period of time, not much. Essentially, 5,890 cases or applications for temporary development, 626 were of these extraordinary types. That isn't very many. So actually, really, there's a reality. There must be something going on that we need to talk about. And when it, really, when it was broken down, it became a tale of two core cities between Liverpool, which had the highest frequency, good old cultural creative Liverpool, and Bristol, which had the highest percentage change, the greatest increase during the recession and recovery period, which is regeneration policy incentivizing these types of temporary developments as a means to renew spaces. When you apply a spatial mechanism, we also start to look at the role a little bit differently in the sense that as there's been a cherry picking in brownfield land, literatures and agendas of particular sites, these extraordinary temporary uses tended to focus largely on central locations. So there was a high clustering in city centre areas, and on top of that then there was an overly, well, a disproportionate frequency in regeneration areas. Ordinary temporary uses were sporadic all over the place. So actually there's a very specific role and function. So that's what we're starting to get to grips with. And really in order to analyze that, you have to break it down right into the micro. And you have to look at the development process in specific context. And actually this entire temporary phenomenon has to be analyzed as a formal part of the development process and broader development cycle. Otherwise you can't really understand what it means. So I did that as well. I love it, love temporary use. 
And it was a comparative analysis between two regeneration areas. So Temple Quarter in Bristol, which is just, as in Bristol Temple Mead Station, is just within that boundary. And then the Creative Quarter in Liverpool, which is just opposite or just to the, to the right of Albert Dock. One is public sector led with temporary development that is public sector facilitated. The other is private sector led with temporary development that is private sector enabled. But both focus on exactly the same type of practice and that was digital tech regeneration and cultural creative clusters. Very interesting post-recessionary model. So in Bristol, there were seven cases that were very interesting, three good quality surface car parks and four extraordinary cases of container box offices and urban agricultural projects. These were all promoted purposefully via regeneration policy to basically incentivize and brand the Bristol Temple Quarter spatial framework. So most of these uses are gone. The agriculture is replaced with an arena, for example. Well, that's fine, it's not a problem. Liverpool, again, similar number of interesting cases. You have four good quality surface car parks, so one more. Yeah. And three or four instances of the extraordinary, which included garden venues and music venues and bars and the botanical gin garden specialising in gin. I don't know if that is part of the happy, healthy agenda. I'm not sure. But anyway. And really, actually, what we see in Liverpool is the private sector attempting to capitalise upon temporary uses that are innovative and creative, but have been completely organic. One sounds slightly more accessible and progressive than the other. And Bristol really sounds like it's really trying to do a lot of hard work to create some sort of a mechanism for these temporary developments. However, they both have exactly the same implications for these types of cultural, creative, or happy, healthy temporary solutions. In the sense that the research has shown that they are more commonly exposed to the vicissitudes of the market they bear a disproportionate share of potential risk, often without the ability to actually generate a reward, in the sense that restricted time frames and greatly reduced permission windows means that they actually don't commonly make profit or even break even. Most cases are done as a means to try and show or sell what a particular organization can do, and that's a big risk. And that actually leads to one of the more fundamental points is that as with any startup business, these are Startup businesses with long-term aspirations and a desire to eventually make profit. So they're not temporary at all, and that's a really, really fundamental point that was often missed. And there's complexity and cost. So most cases, infrastructure and groundworks was in, a, in excess of about £35,000. Investment levels were typically set at between 50 to 200 grand. Not really accessible everyday urbanism. We're kind of part of that problem. I'm an urban designer myself, okay, I'm not going to blame anyone in particular, but we do have a habit of prioritizing the particular and the extraordinary at the expense of more ordinary and everyday things. And through this analysis, you can start to see the multivariate nature and form of temporary development. And really what it starts to do is address the idea that we need to go beyond the overly celebratory. And in that sense, it necessitates a deeper understanding of the variable market logics. So why temporary uses or solutions are put in place at specific times or why in specific places those questions have to be answered. And not to end on a negative, but I will end on a negative, is that ultimately cultural creative temporary development cannot be a solution for every urban ailment. What we need to maybe think about now is the idea that there's the ordinary and the extraordinary and we need to think about the middle ground. So not too negative, progressively critical I would say. Thanks very much.